welcome to the first of three impressions, three questions with the Thoughtful Gamer. My name is Mark, here with me is Matt and Ben, and we just played Whoa. Rise of Tribes from Breaking Games yeah, for the very did. first time. And we have some thoughts about it, that's what we're going to go over. Uh, this is our brand new video segment where we're going to be playing games and then getting our first impressions of that game. So probably for the first or second time we played, and then we're going to give you three impressions of that game and three questions that we're thinking about, that we will be thinking about, the next times we play that game. So, uh, Rise of Tribes is a sort of simple civilization game where you're going to be going on the map here, you're going to be adding more meeples to the board, you're going to be gathering resources, you're going to be turning in those resources for villages, or different upgrades and point gathering things, and ultimately it's a pretty simple straightforward race to 15 victory points. Uh, stuff we've seen before, but with some interesting twists that we haven't seen before. So let's start, get started with the first impression. What is our first impression, Ben? We we, we thought that this game didn't really... It, it offers the ability for conflict, but it doesn't really deliver on that promise. The, the conflict that was there was accidental. We, we never actually tried to butt heads or um, really interact with each other at all. Yeah, the combat's interesting because unlike most games where you resolve com combat as soon as you go into another person's territory, in this game it only happens when there are a certain number of people in that hex. So if you have a small numbers of people, uh, you can intermingle. As soon as it reaches this breaking point, though, fight breaks out and, and, and most of them get destroyed. Uh, but we only saw it happen once, and it wasn't even intentional. <laughs> it was due to an event card that lowered that that fighting threshold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the um, I think it's super interesting that um, everything feels close together for an area con control game, and quickly in the game it became apparent that we filled most of the map. There were borders drawn, um, so I thought that was cool. And then I was surprised. Yeah, how passive that interaction was. It was yeah. combat uh, is really expensive. Yeah, and it's um, so I, I I think it's interesting, um, but it did feel passive. Yeah, and it's one of the and it's one of a couple things that may, that reminded me a little bit of Scythe, um, in that it's not really a game about combat. It's about being super efficient with your actions, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. The second of our impressions is that the event cards are really thematic and really fun. I, I was very pleasantly surprised by how much enjoyment I got out of the event cards. And all of them made sense. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, something, you know, it, it talks about this one thing and the result is you, like, lose two resources. No, it was literally a volcano gets <laughs> dropped on the board and it erupts and then kills people adjacent to it. Or a saber-toothed tiger comes onto the board and starts eating people. Or yeah. you, your fishing becomes more efficient because there's a surge of fish. Like, all of them were very simple, but made complete thematic sense. Yeah, it is really neat. Um, there are these extra tokens that were kind of off to the side. So when, I, when, we, when we started our first game, it was kind of, kind of weird. I was skeptical that, why do we need all of these extra tokens that aren't explained up front? Um, but then it, it just worked, it, like you said. Um, what's cooler than a mammoth just dropping and <laughs> wading into your lake? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and they come out semi-randomly. You have a, what, a th one out of three chance every turn. Every player's turn, you have a yeah, one out of three exactly chance one, one to, three. to yeah. get an, an event. Um, so they come out fairly frequently, too. And I was impressed by the mechanics of that, because I never felt like... There was an event here that was here for too long. Uh, most of them have, most of them will fall off after a few turns. Uh, either they get used or they expire. Um, and we didn't have one just sitting around here the whole game that no one used. Yeah, and I like that they stuck around too. Right? If you're playing a game on a civilizational level, you would want, I mean, unless it's like through the ages where you're just shooting through time. You want big major events to kind of stick around and have a lasting impact. Yeah. So third uh, initial impression, um, the game presents some really interesting 
kind of systems, but I, I felt like I had less agency than I expected going into it. Um, so I think one example we kind of talked about earlier um, was the passive kind of borderlines um, that I, I, I never really felt like I was going to really, you know, make, make a break and change the borders uh, in a really significant way. And I, I think uh, even more so, we have this interesting mechanic here. On your turn, you roll two of the dice um, to, um, that you then use to choose your actions. And you can see that the dice have uh, suns and moons on them. And as you place a dice, it, it pushes them pushes them down, and then basically on that row, if there are two suns, you get a like a booming, better version of that action. If there are two moons, you get a, a worse version of that action. So I was expecting some really cool interplay about um, punishing what I knew my opponents were going to do in future turns by putting a moon there, or really taking advantage of suns. And I, and I ended up feeling like it was more just um, based on what had to be done at the time. Yeah. Uh, or, or what I randomly rolled and, and didn't have as much control over it, over that kind of, what I expected to be more of a, a fun tactical game. Yeah, I think I made one decision on the dice of what action I would take based on leaving a bad state for yeah. the next player. And I think you could go a fair number of games and never really have a viable choice yeah. in that regard. And, you're and just going to do what's best and for And that'll you. really be even further diminished if you're playing with four. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe it's more interesting at two? I don't know. Two may change. Yeah, and I think yeah. two two players may change a lot of things about this game, yeah. as with most games. Sure. Right? Two-player games are just fundamentally different than multiplayer games in some very important ways. Um, and, yeah, it's going to be the same thing here. So let's move on to our three questions about what are we going to be thinking about the next time we play Rise of Tribes. What's our first one, Matt? First question is, is this game ultimately just tactical? Uh, so I think uh, there's some interesting ideas of strategies that we saw. Um, can you focus on um, building up these technologies, which are these blue cards, um, that are worth less points, but give you some kind of bonus. Um, you know, is it a viable strategy to go hard after those rather than uh, the bigger scoring cards? Or is just a military strategy, a, like a viable strategy? Or is it more what we found where it's just a tiny bit of each um, kind of in the moment to score points each turn? So, yeah, I, I don't think... It would, I don't know, like there are different areas that, different things that games can do to create long-term strategic decision making. One of them is viable, or is variable player powers, which this game has, but they're so minimal and so small that, I don't know, at least the ones we saw didn't have much going for them. It was a very marginal bonus. I, I think mine may have been the most impactful. Um, I got, it really made making villages worthwhile for me. Um, I, I got an extra food every time I gathered per village. Um, so by the end of the game, I was getting two extra food every time I gathered, which which made a difference, and it made my economy stronger. I, but I mean, but how much was that? Over the course of the game, that's one action, basically, of efficiency you get out of that? Um, I think I netted two, five, or six food. Yeah, that's so action, basically action one half. gather action. Yeah. Like, mine saved me two resources over the course of the game. Now, I think yeah, the tactical decisions are good. Yeah, I don't so, think it's a negative if it's purely tactical. Yeah, but, but, but we'd have to adjust our expectations there, of this kind of genre. There were hints of, yeah, more strategic things that I'm not sure are actually there. Yeah. I think any any strategy is going to be pretty marginally helpful. I, I don't. I do think it's it is largely tactical. Yeah, and that's again, that's not necessarily a criticism. It's a, it's a game about adapting. So our second question is: Is military viable in this game? Uh, there's a really high cost to military. Uh, you 
you lose all of your pieces except for the ones that you have more than the other person. And like that's you know that that's basically a whole grow action, uh, depending on how many people you have in there. So it it negates that. You also have to move the people in there. It, so there's a lot that goes into using military. And I think at at the end of the day, maybe every once in a while, but I don't I don't think it it can it, I don't think it has legs. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if there's like a play of this where we're all hyper aggressive um, because like the payoff really is that you prevent the other person from scoring points. Yeah. But I mean, in a three player game or even a four player game, you have the classic problem of if two people go to combat, the only thing that helps is the people not in combat. Yeah. And it really doesn't provide extra incentives that some games like commit provide. Yeah. Well, I mean, commit's an extreme. (laughs) Fair. But there's there's only one incentive. It's this guy, this this extra meeple, which is part of the advanced variant of the game, which you should just play with. It's not that much more complicated. And I think almost, it's got to be almost necessary because that guy is worth a victory point if you kill him. Yeah. And he's tied to a village. Otherwise, there's no benefit for killing a village yeah. other than stopping that person from getting a victory point every round. And I, I think I could see it being viable if killing that person's village would prevent them from winning the game. Um, yeah. But that's basically the only way I see it being worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Our final question is, will randomness frustrate us? Now, it's something I always think about after I play most games, honestly, because there's that fine line that you have to build into any design that has even moderate amounts of randomness. And this isn't a super random game. It's... Again, it reminds me of games like Scythe. It reminds me of Inish a bit. Um, in that it's very... In terms of actions, like the number of actions you, you have is very tight. The race is very quick. Um, and it's about making those actions as efficient as possible. But because it's so tight, the areas where there are randomness may become frustrating. I'm thinking particularly the fact that you randomly draw your your cards that give you the goals to get most of your victory points that you're going to get. Yep. Like maybe you could go really hard on villages and try to build up three, four villages a turn, you know, or three or four villages really quick. None of us did that. We got up to two maximum. But honestly, these are just cheaper points. Yeah, it, it seems or easier points. And But you randomly draw them. Like... You kind of want to get the easier ones, the blue ones like this, that give you a power early on, and I literally didn't draw one the first two times I drew cards. Yeah, and that that really, you know, furthers to my question of can you have a strategy? When yeah, when a strategy is gonna depend so much on getting a particular kind of these. Um and I, I could cards. see I could see a strategy where you just do lead every turn. Um, because you know you it, it is additive like you in, unless you get unless you buy these cards you'll just accumulate more and more so you can yeah. you can cycle through your deck but that comes eventually. Added, that comes well, at that's the cost, the cost of, of board control comes at the cost yeah. of yeah. creating villages which just you're giving if other people are creating villages they're just getting points while you're yeah. extending the game for yourself I don't know if that's viable yeah um on the other hand like I thought the event randomness was was just fine uh you know based on the reasons you talked about well it was fairly equal across the board equal and and reasonable um and as far as the board state goes there's almost no randomness there's a bit Um, of randomness on setup um, but yeah yeah Yeah. there's a little bit with whether or not you're going to get a powerful action or not i think drawing the cards is the big yeah uh the big area of variability in the game that that's making me a bit skeptical but overall, I think a fairly strong first impression of Rise of Tribes. Uh, if you saw my review of, uh, what was that? Was it just Tribes? Tribes. Tribes, yeah. I'm getting all the names confused. It's definitely better than that game. And this is kind of what that game was going for. Uh, but this is light years ahead of that, which was Man. pretty bad. You played that one, right? Tribes? Yeah, just once. It was, I think I played it. It was not great. Um, it was fine. We'll see. 
Man, I just we'll thought of a really good question. question. You thought of a really good bonus fourth, bonus question. fourth question. What's our fourth question? Well, I Matt? wonder if it's always going to have the Catan end game of like the last round and a half. We just all see the end, and it's just like marginally trying to. Why well, it's a race game? I it's mean, a race game. That's yeah. going to happen. The, I I thought of that. It really felt like Catan at the end, just uh, trying to score those last points. Yeah. So, eh, I I wonder if that gets to be exceedingly annoying, or it's just, you know, it's just part of the game. Yeah, I don't know if I'll mind that that much. Yeah. Anyways, it's our first time doing three questions, three, three impressions, three questions, and we've already broken the format. That, that feels appropriate. Sounds like a win to me. It sounds like a thoughtful <laughs> gamer. Thanks for watching this. If Again, this is kind of a test run of this. I haven't done much video before, but I'm trying to expand my horizons. I'm trying to do different things. So if you enjoyed this, please comment below or send me an email or tweet at me. Or, uh, just let me know what you think. And if you want to see more of these, I think I'm going to take it easy with, with these. Maybe work up to like every other week, perhaps. Um, or I don't know. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I, I think this will be fun to get more video. But that's Rise of Tribes from Breaking Games. Uh, I think a fairly positive first impression. We have some concerns going forward. Uh, let us know what you think of the game if you've played it. And thanks for watching. Bye. Peace. <laughs>